Dear Muslims, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala till our father Adam alayhi salam, there were creations before him. And one of these creations was the entity known as Iblis. And Iblis, from the beginning of time, as soon as he saw Adam, developed a feeling of jealousy, an extreme irrational hatred, a feeling of such evil that Iblis declared right then and there that he shall be an eternal enemy, not only to Adam, but to the wife of Adam and to the future children of Adam. The level of depravity, the level of irrational anger that Iblis had is something that is unparalleled in the creation. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warned us against Iblis from the very beginning of time. As soon as Iblis rebelled against our father Adam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions his story. And Allah says that Iblis said, Iblis is challenging Allah. And Iblis said, do you see this being whom you preferred over me? Iblis is jealous. This being whom you preferred over me. If you allow me to live until the day of judgment, then I shall misguide every one of his progeny. Allah Azza wa Jal tells us that this was the story of Iblis from the beginning of time. Iblis also challenged Allah and blamed Allah for his arrogance. Iblis says, Qala Rabbi bima My Lord, because you have deceived me. Iblis blamed Allah. That's his arrogance. It's not only angry at us, he's angry at Allah, blaming Allah. Rabbi bima aghwaitani. Ya Rabb, because you deceived me. Iblis says, لَهُمْ صِرَاطَكَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ I will sit waiting for them as they're coming down the straight path. His level of hatred, he is literally waiting for the rightly guided. He's waiting for the pious and righteous. He is waiting in anticipation to trap us. Then, ثُمَّ لَآتِيَنَّهُمْ مِنْ بَيْنِ أَيْدِيهِمْ I will attack them from the front وَعَنْ أَيْمَانِهِمْ And from the right وَعَنْ شَمَائِلِهِمْ And from the left وَلَا تَجْدُ أَكْثَرَهُمْ شَاكِرِينَ And oh Allah, from now I'm telling you, I'm going to be so successful that the majority of this new creation, they will not be thankful to you. And Allah Azza wa Jal warned our mother and father, as soon as they entered Jannah, Allah Azza wa Jal blessed them with Jannah. Allah says to Adam, وَقُلْنَا يَا آدَمُ اسْكُنَنْتَ وَزَوْجُكَ الْجَنَّةِ And as soon as they enter Jannah, Allah says to them, but be careful. Be careful, O Adam. إِنَّ هَذَا عَدُوٌ لَكَ وَلِزَوْجِكَ This being over here, pointing him out, this being is your enemy and the enemy of your wife, Hawwa. The Quran tells us Adam was warned. Hawwa was warned. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Adam down, he also warned Adam at that point in time that, oh Adam, the two of you are going to be fitness to each other. Oh Adam, be careful. Warn your children of this entity. Warn your children to not follow this one who misguided you, this one who caused your fall. And Allah sent prophet after prophet to warn us about the dangers of Iblis. Allah sends prophet after prophet. And on the day of judgment, Allah Azza wa Jal will remind mankind. Allah will say to mankind, O oh children of Adam, didn't I tell you, O oh children of Adam, Ata'budu shaytan? Didn't I tell you not to worship shaytan? Didn't I tell you he is your clear enemy to you? Notice at every stage of the creation, at every footstep of the beginning of time, Allah Azza wa Jal is warning Adam and the children of Adam about the dangers of Iblis. Let us talk a little bit about this reality, this entity known as Iblis. Iblis is of course his name. Shaytan is a description. Shaytan is his adjective. And it means the one who is obstinate, the one who is rebellious, the one who misguides. Everybody who turns you away from the path of Allah is a Shaytan. There is one Iblis. There are many Shaytans. Iblis is the proper name of the leader of the Shaytans. Shaytans belong to jinn. Shaytans belong to ints. Shaytan is anybody who's trying to take you away from the path. And the leader of those who want to take you away is Iblis. So the first question that arises, the first question that arises that we ask ourselves in is what is the wisdom in the creation of Iblis? You know, many times our young son or daughter comes to us and says, 
father, mother, abati, why did Allah create this evil being called shaitan? Why did Allah create Iblis? I mean, forget children, sometimes we ask, why would Allah create Iblis? And the response to this is actually not simple to say, but we can respond preliminarily by stating the premise of this question is the assumption that Allah should create us and put us into Jannah immediately. There should be no evil, no pain, no suffering. We want to have ultimate peace immediately. And we say, but no, that's not this dunya. That's the next life. And we shall get that peace where there is no Iblis. We shall get that place of no pain, no evil, no suffering. But we have to earn it. We have to walk through this life, avoiding the temptations of Iblis. The presumption that there should be no evil only comes from the mind of the one who thinks he's entitled. Since Allah created me, this world should be perfect. But we say it is perfect for our time and place. And it is a stepping stone to the real perfection of the next. So there must be an element of Allah knows we might not fully understand. And that's why even the angels ask, why would you do this, O Allah? And Allah says, I know what you do not know. So we begin by stating we must resign the wisdom of the creation of Iblis ultimately to Allah. But we can find some consolation in some aspects. And Ibn al-Qayyim, for example, in his famous book, Ighathat al-Lahafan, he actually has 25 pages dedicated to the question of why would Allah create Iblis? And he has wisdoms that are very profound. You will find some translations of this document in English uh, somewhere on, 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 online. But I'll summarize some of these points. Ibn al-Qayyim says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala desires the purity of his followers. Allah desires the iman and taqwa, the isti'ada, the tawakkul, the inaba. Allah desires the piety of the righteous. And that piety shall only be manifested by fighting against Iblis. There must be an Iblis that manifests the piety of the righteous people. And so when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed this evil entity to exist, it is not because he likes the evil. It is because he loves the piety that comes in combating the evil. The righteousness that comes in overcoming that evil. Also of the wisdoms is that Allah Azza wa Jal personified evil. Can you imagine if evil were some type of cosmic force? If evil were not an actual created entity, what would we do then? But we have evil personified in one being, one entity. And we thank Allah for this because we can now feel a sense of consolation knowing that evil is manifested in one makhluk. And this makhluk is not all powerful. This makhluk is not God. This makhluk is a creation of Allah. And so evil can be conquered when we turn to the one who created this entity. So we thank Allah that evil can be personified in one being. We know that being. We have been told to take precautions against that being. Also of the wisdoms is a lesson for all of us in the story of our father Adam alayhi salam. Iblis is no stranger to humanity. Imagine if we had somebody who showed no enmity to us, no harm to us. We would say, how can we be scared of this entity? Why should we hate this entity? But Allah Azza wa Jal in his wisdom allowed the same entity to be the cause of the downfall of our mother and father. The same entity to do what he did to Adam and Hawa. The same entity to continue to fight every single prophet. And so when we have one particular entity whom history has shown has caused so much damage, then how can we not take precautions? How can we not feel a sense of genuine anger at this entity and turn to Allah to protect ourselves from this entity? Also of the wisdoms of the creation of this evil known as Iblis is that we see the diversity of the power of Allah Azza wa Jal. He creates the best of the best and He creates other than this. He creates Jibra'il and Mika'il and He creates Iblis and the Jinn. He creates the Prophets and He creates Fir'aun and Abu Lahab and all the rest of them. So Allah Azza wa Jal's Qudra is manifested. Allah's power is manifested. And in this we are in awe at the magnificence of the Creator. 
of the wisdoms of the creation of this entity is that we can truly appreciate good only by contrasting it with evil. We can appreciate beauty when we see what exactly is ugly. We can appreciate the brightness of the day only after the darkness of the night. So by having these contrasts and by knowing how evil an entity can be, because in the end of the day, the evil of Iblis is completely irrational. He gains nothing by misguiding us. He's going to Jahannam anyway. He gains nothing by causing us harm. What an irrational evil is this? And we have done nothing to him such that he's an enemy to us. But when that evil is there, so then we are able to understand that there is a particular being, a makhluk of Allah, who harbors so much evil that we have to take our precautions. We have to be careful. And this helps us be more righteous. Of the wisdoms as well and this is a very profound point brothers and sisters pay attention to this of the wisdoms of the creation of this entity known as Iblis is that it is actually therapeutic for our own salvation it is therapeutic for our own betterment there is a psychological wisdom in having the embodiment the personification of evil how so because you know when you want to overcome a personal problem when you have committed a major mistake a major crime you know, in this environment and complex, the psychologists say you can't continue to blame yourself for a past mistake. You have to let go and move on, right? In our case, we don't have to just let go. We can easily and factually and correctly blame Iblis for a sin that we have done. And it is correct, Iblis was the one who misguided us, who gave us waswasa. And use that blame in order to make ourselves empowered to move on to live better lives. Now I have to be clear here, we do not blame Iblis in a court of law. We cannot blame Iblis on the day of judgment. It's not going to work. But we can blame Iblis in our personal journey to Allah in our reflections of our own past and we think about what we've done and we say astaghfirullah that wasn't me i'm better than that i shouldn't have done that because that wasn't coming from me that was from iblis and the whisperings of iblis and if i can cut off iblis i can eliminate iblis then i am a better person with the help of allah and that is factually true that is factually true. When we have an entity that we can legitimately blame for our own shortcomings of the past. Again, this is not a justification of the current. It is not an excuse of the future. Iblis is not going to be able to be blamed on the day of judgment. It doesn't work that way. But in this dunya, in our journey to Allah, we are not only allowed to, the Quran and Sunnah shows us, we blame Iblis, listen to me carefully, for a past mistake or sin in order to rectify ourselves in order to overcome and be better people when musa accidentally asked uh, khidr that question musa uh, made the condition khidr made the condition don't ask me anything and musa asked the first time he asked he said don't blame me shaitan caused me to forget this is uh, Yusha and, 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 uh, and Musa, the story of Yusha and Khidr and Musa. Don't, don't blame me, shaitan caused me to forget. When Yusuf and his brothers had a fight and his brothers did what they did, Yusuf being the wise prophet, how did he recover? How did he bring about unity? He said, shaitan caused you all to do this. It wasn't from you. Now question, who threw Yusuf in the well? The brothers or shaitan? Well, it was the brothers, but who whispered it to them? Who zayyana lahum was shaitan? Who beautified it? Clearly it was shaitan. Now that Yusuf wants to mend the hearts, now that we need to move forward, we can bring in this third party called Iblis. We can say, that's not you. You're better than that. That was Iblis. And you're correct. You're factually correct. When you blame Iblis, this is passing the responsibility of a past sin. You still have to make them in the eyes of Allah in order that you rectify yourself. And what a beautiful, amazing, psychological blessing. You are better than this, brothers and sisters. Wallahi, you're better than this. Something happened in the past that is shameful. You committed a sin that really causes you pain. Well, it's good it causes you pain. It's good it causes you shame. But guess what? You need to stop just blaming yourself and realize, yes, Iblis was involved and you can be better. And your addiction, that's coming from Iblis. That evil that you did, 
that harsh statement that you said, the physical pain that you caused, the stealing that you did, the sharab, the khamar, everything that you did, it was Iblis's fault. Now be better. Cut him out of your life. Stand up and be a worshiper of Allah. Turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and blame that evil. A'udhu billahi min shaytan rajim Blame him because you are a better person. This is a beautiful wisdom in the creation and in the manifestation of this entity. Because, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمِ Allah created us good. Allah created us high up. And then, shaytan waswas and shaytan misguides. So we get rid of shaytan and we come back to the ahsani taqweem. And many other wisdoms can be mentioned as well. The next point of our khutbah, what are some of the tactics of shaytan? What are some of the ways that he uses to cause us to commit a mistake? Well, the first of them is the gentlest one. And because it is so gentle, Allah Azza wa has forgiven it if, if Iblis is successful. And that is the way of forgetfulness. The way of causing us to not remember something. And I quoted you the story of Yusha and Musa. When uh, uh, Yusha forgot uh, to, to uh, take the fish out at the right time, right? When Yusha forgot the sign, excuse me. Then he says, look, وَمَا أَنْسَانِهُ لَلشَّيْطَانُ وَنَذْكُرَ Shaitan caused me to forget. And at times, shaitan causes you to oversleep Fajr. And at times, shaitan causes you to do things you don't intend to do them. Well, if it's accidental, if you really forgot, then Allah forgives you. You just make it up in your personal life. There's no sin on you. But this is of the tactics of shaitan. You're supposed to pray dhuhr. You look at the time and say, oh, two hours left, inshallah, I'll pray. Then shaitan comes, check this email, do this, do that. Next thing you know, it's out of time, it's asr time. Astaghfirullah, I missed it. If you genuinely had the intention, this is a tactic of shaitan. Blame shaitan, say, a'udhu billah min shaitan rajim. Take precautions for next time and then move on. But this is of the tactics of Iblis. Of the tactics of Iblis, is to catch you at a point of weakness. To see, monitor. Maybe you metaphorically put your foot on a slippery slope. And perhaps it would have been good enough if you did it. But Iblis knows it's a slippery slope. And right when it was a slippery slope, he pushed you a little bit more. Of course, I'm being metaphorical here. You were in a situation of weakness. And if you were on your own, you would have overcome that weakness. But Iblis comes and Iblis pushes you metaphorically iblis causes you to slip allah says in the quran about the battle of uhud and about the fact that some of the companions withdrew when they should not have withdrawn withdrawn allah says shaytan shaytan caused them to slip slip meaning they they put their place on a they put their foot on a place they shouldn't have but if shaytan were not there it would have been good enough they would have moved on but shaytan saw a weakness a moment where you let your guards down a little bit, just a little bit, you could have overcome. But shaitan monitored, shaitan saw, and all of a sudden he pushed you more. This is istazalla, this is zalla, this is a mistake that is a one off. Well, you learn from the mistake and you move on. The third tactic, which is the most common tactic of shaitan, is waswasa. And waswasa means to whisper into our soul, to give us ideas and thoughts that we would not otherwise have. Waswasa here means he will literally implant ideas that we would otherwise not have. Every one of us, sometimes we think of something and then we say, Astaghfirullah, where did that idea come from? Where did this evil thought come from? And it is not from us. It is shaitan putting ideas into our heads. Shaitan has the capacity. Shaitan has the physical capability of whispering into our soul. Just like humans can whisper into the ear, shaitan can whisper into the soul. Shaitan cannot read your mind, by the way. Shaitan cannot read your mind. But shaitan can see you're alone and you have the opportunity to steal some money. Waswasa. You're alone and there might be a non mahram. Waswasa. You're alone or whatever it might be. This is waswasa. He will give something in your mind and head or will entice you, keep on putting something. Why don't you do this? Do this, do this until it becomes something constant in you. This is one of the tactics of shaitan. The fourth tactic of shaitan is zakhrafa, to make something more alluring than it actually is. And he employed this tactic with our father Adam. It was a normal tree, a normal whatever, apple, whatever it was. We don't know what it was, something it was there. And shaitan added some free deals, complete lies. If you eat of this tree, you will get eternal life. If you eat of this tree, no pain and suffering. No doubt it was a sweet fruit, it's from Jannah. But this added lies, this beautification, this blatant false marketing, this is shaitan. 
and shaitan always markets falsely all of his marketing is blatant lies all of his marketing is blatant lies he will come and make something more alluring or more tempting than it actually is or maybe even it's not even tempting at all but he will make you think it is tempting and this is the called uh, zayyana or zakhrafa to make it more beautiful than it actually is and this is something we find it in the hadith that our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that when a person of the opposite gender leaves the house, shaitan makes that person look more beautiful than that person actually is. You think that person is more beautiful than that actually is. And you start feeling waswasa. And that's why our Prophet said, Subhanallah, if you feel something about somebody you shouldn't feel, then go to your spouse, go to your halal partner. Because in reality, what the other person has, your other partner has as well. It's just shaitan making you think, oh, this one is 10 times more beautiful or 10 times more handsome whereas in reality this is from the waswasa and the zakhrafa of shaitan so we learn this is a tactic of shaitan don't buy the false promises of shaitan don't fall prey to the marketing of shaitan shaitan is a liar he does nothing but lie he has been lying since the creation of adam up until our times so when you see the forbidden fruit when you see that which is haram and shaitan comes and makes you feel oh this is this and that realize this is the lies of shaitan it's not that tempting it's not that sweet it's not that beautiful in reality this is the zakhrafa of shaitan of the tactics of shaitan is to make you feel scared of something takhweef of the tactics of shaitan is to make you feel scared of something and the quran mentions this that this is shaitan making his allies and followers feel scared don't fear them only fear me and of the classic examples is the quran the hadith mentions this when we want to give charity when we want to give charity shaitan will come and say don't be a fool your family needs you if you give charity you will be poor don't be a fool you're going to become poor when you're generous to others this is a scare tactic and of course we are told to be moderate in our giving we are not giving everything but neither are we supposed to be stingy and shaitan comes and doesn't want us to give anything and this is something very explicit in the quran that shaitan shaitan threatens you you're going to be poor shaitan makes you scared you're going to be poor don't give to charity and allah azza wa Jalla says and i am promising you it's not a threat i am promising you you shall be mashallah aghniya meaning you will have the wealth of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you will have the barakah of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so this is of the tactics of shaitan of the tactics of shaitan as well and this is of the most evil tactics is that he causes certain people to speak without knowledge and to misguide others it's one thing to be misguided yourself but there are people whose profession is to misguide others they are shayateen in human form this hadith the prophet said that there are people calling to jahannam shayateen fi surat al ins they are shayateen in human form meaning as we said shaitan is any entity that is misguiding you from the true path and there are shaitans of the jinn and they are shaitan of the ins anyone who is calling you to disobey allah anyone who is trying to get you away from the path of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is a type of shaitan and shaitan has allies he has representatives he has salesperson for his merchandise amongst us and these salespeople, they tell you to embrace evil they tell you to give up religiosity they make fun of religiosity they say if you are religious you are backward if you pray you're going to give up your career etc etc and these are people sometimes you are mesmerized by their speech sometimes you think they are the most intelligent but you cannot be intelligent if you don't know the purpose of your life you are not wise if you haven't figured out what you're doing on this earth doesn't matter what degrees you have and how much income you have if you don't know the purpose of your life then all of your wealth is meaningless so be careful and don't fall prey to the whisperings of the human shayateen the whisperings of those who are making many problems of our times whatever philosophies that might be there whatever ways of opposing islam might be there they're trying to beautify it and sell it to you this is of the tactics of shaitan and the final point we'll mention which is so pertinent to our communities of the explicit tactics of shaitan of the explicit tactics of shaitan is to disunite the ummah and to cause friction between brothers and cousins between people of one family between people of one community between people of the kalima this is explicitly mentioned in the quran 
in the shaitan yanzaghu baynahum shaitan causes disharmony between them what did shaitan do with yusuf and his brothers min ba'di an nazagha shaitan bayni wa bayni ikhwati shaitan caused me and my brothers to fall into this this fight and allah azza wa jal mentions that shaitan wants you to gamble and shaitan wants you to drink why why does shaitan want you to do this inna ma yuridu shaitan an yuqa baynakum al adawatu wal baghda shaitan wants you to fight and get into problems when you are drinking when you're gambling shaitan wants to break up the ummah so any time you see a break up happening anytime you see that you're falling out from a friend from a family member that a community is breaking apart realize shaitan is getting happy we know from the hadith as well shaitan loves to break up a couple that's married this is one of the biggest tactics of shaitan he wants to cause divorce shaitan loves to break people up whether they're couples whether they're families whether they're communities and this is one of the worst and most evil tactics of shaitan we have to be on our guard against them brothers and sisters and be aware of the tactics in order to calm combat shaitan but we now need to move on to a very practical point how do we protect ourselves against this entity what are the most effective mechanisms to fortify ourselves against this evil entity we'll mention six or seven points number one of the ways to protect ourselves against shaitan is to have a purity of intention to want to please allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you desire to please Allah and you don't care about the fame and the praise of mankind, you have erected one of the most powerful fortresses against you and shaitan. If you don't desire fame, fortune, money, if you want the rida of Allah, you want the pleasure of Allah, then automatically you have weakened the forces of shaitan. In fact, shaitan himself told us, it's in the Quran, Shaitan himself told us, you shall not find most of them thankful. I shall misguide most of them. Then Shaitan made one exception. إِلَّا عِبَادَكَ مِنْهُمُ الْمُخْلِصِينَ إِلَّا عِبَادَكَ مِنْهُمُ الْمُخْلِصِينَ فِي قِرَاءَ That except for your servants who have ikhlas, I will not be able to touch them. SubhanAllah, Shaitan tells us, he's telling Allah and Allah is telling us. He told Allah, you have one category, I will not be able to reach them, O oh Allah. Who is that category? Mukhlis. You have to have ikhlas, what you do for the sake of Allah, not for the sake of the people. That's the number one mechanism. Number two of the ways we protect ourselves is overall the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is of the most powerful antidotes and mechanisms to protect ourselves against shaitan. All types of dhikr. Of them is the Quran, which is the greatest dhikr. Our Prophet Sallallahu said that shaitan does not come inside a house in which Surah Al-Baqarah is recited. Brothers, why aren't you reciting Surah Baqarah in your house? Shaitan will not come inside that house. I'm not saying you have to recite all in one day. Every day, two, three, four pages so that there's a continual recitation. Shaitan will not enter the house where Baqarah is being recited. How can we not? You know, we have alarms in our houses. We have the ADT sticker. We have this and that. Wallahi, don't we need protection of shaitan more important than protection from uh, uh, entities of mankind? Recite the Quran in your house and the angels will fortify it. Of them is the adhan. When we give the adhan, shaitan runs away, flees when he hears the adhan. Shaitan cannot bear to hear the adhan. So imagine your child is giving the adhan every day in the house. Imagine you're just praying your salah, come together for Dhuhr children, come together for Maghrib, and they give the adhan, the iqamah, shaitan will run away. Of them is the isti'ada. A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim Allah says in the Quran, if you feel anything shaitanic, if you feel shaitan whispering into you, Say, A'udhu Billah. Allah hears and Allah knows and Allah sees. Anytime you start thinking of an evil, anytime you feel inclined to go on the wrong path, say, A'udhu Billahi min shaitan rajim. Because that inclination is not coming from you, it's coming from shaitan. We talked about this. You are better than this brother and sister. You don't have to go down this path. It's not you, it's shaitan. But in order to overcome shaitan, you have to go to the Lord of the heavens and earth. A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim. Of them is to say bismillah of the adhkar. To say bismillah frequently, constantly. When we say bismillah, when we enter the house, shaitan will not come there. When we say bismillah before we eat, shaitan cannot eat. When we say bismillah before we change our clothes, shaitan cannot see us. Even before being intimate with our spouse, we think of Allah subhanahu 
subhanahu wa ta'ala, shaitan will be eliminated. Constantly say Bismillah before we do any deed. And all types of adhkar will protect us from shaitan. Of the ways that we protect ourselves from shaitan as well, is overall piety, overall taqwa, just extra ibadah, extra tahajjud, extra salah, extra sadaqa, extra siyam. Overall, the more we are pious and righteous in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then the more the barrier will be between us and shaitan. In fact, our Prophet called the dhikr of Allah, the worship of Allah, he said that it is like a hisnun haseen. It is a protected fortress between you and shaitan. Protected fortress. All of the rituals that you do, the ibadat that you do, they will be a barrier between you and shaitan. And so brothers and sisters, just like shaitan can attack two people with the same ferocity, one of them has a wall of protection and the other doesn't. Who is shaitan going to harm more? Who is shaitan going to harm more? The one who doesn't have the wall of protection. We build that wall of protection by all of these good deeds. And the final point that we'll mention, and of course this is a partial list as always, the final point that we'll mention is a very important one. And of the tactics of shaitan, our Prophet wasallam said, stick with the community of believers. For shaitan can attack the solitary Muslim, the solitary person, and he is farther away from attacking two people and even farther from attacking three. Stick with the group of righteous people. Don't break away. Be a part of your community. Pray regularly in the masjid. Attend the halaqat. Have pious friends around you and be amongst the company of the righteous and automatically you're going to build defense mechanisms against shaitan. But if you're cut off from a Muslim community, if you don't have righteous friends, our Prophet literally said, for shaitan is more capable of attacking the solitary person just like the wolf can attack the solitary sheep and the sheep that are all together the wolf cannot attack them so too the righteous Muslim with the righteous community of friends and a good gathering and a good community shaitan has more difficulty attacking so stick with the jama'ah of Muslims stick with the community of Muslims and it will protect you in this journey of that we're working our way towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brothers and sisters remember remember on the day of judgment shaitan will give his final farewell address the uh, Ibn al-Qayyim calls it the khutbah of shaitan. Ibn al-Qayyim calls it the khutbah of shaitan. And I've given a whole khutbah about the khutbah of shaitan. You can listen to it. But what is the khutbah of shaitan? One, one line, memorize it. One phrase, memorize it. Shaitan will say to the followers of his who are heading to Jahannam. Because the followers will say, oh Allah, it's shaitan's fault. And I, sa I said to you, you cannot blame shaitan on the day of judgment. That's not going to work. Shaitan will speak to his own followers. And shaitan will say to all of them, وَمَا كَانَ لِيَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْ سُلْطَانٍ I had no power over you. I didn't force you. You weren't my puppets. I didn't force you that whatever I said you had to do. وَمَا كَانَ لِيَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْ سُلْطَانٍ But I only did one thing. إِلَّا أَنْ دَعَوْتُكُمْ I invited you. I called you out. وَسْوَسَ زَخْرَفَ I gave you the tactics. I invited you. فَاسْتَجَبْتُمْ لِي you were the ones who listened to my invitation. You believe my false promises. You listen to what I'm doing. So shaitan says, Fala talumuni. Stop blaming me. Walumu anfusakum. Blame yourselves. This is a part of the khutbah of shaitan. Brothers and sisters, in this life, we have the capacity to repel shaitan, to fortify ourselves against shaitan. That's what we're supposed to be doing. We are better than this. Allah created us to be pure and good, and shaitan is misguiding us. So my advice to myself and all of you, rise up to the potential that Allah wanted for you and Allah created you for. Cut off from shaitan. Turn to Allah. Give up the lifestyle that is an evil lifestyle. And insha'Allah ta'ala, in defeating shaitan, and in overcoming shaitan, that is how we will return to the abode where we were before shaitan caused our mother and father to be expelled from it.